This is Diane Downs, and you may be wondering, why is this sweet little pregnant lady in handcuffs being arrested? It's because she is a fucking murderer, and she's up for parole in 2021. Diane married her high school sweetheart, Steve Downs, and they immediately started having kids. She always said she wanted to be a mom. Their oldest daughter is Christy Ann. And then they had Cheryl Lynn, and then they had their son, Daniel. Diane got kicked out of college for promiscuous behavior. Steve claims that Daniel isn't his son, and that he is a result of an affair. So they get a divorce. In Diane's words, she said that she had 10 different partners that she had relations with, and less than half of them were married. So then, Diane starts seeing this guy named Robert Knickerbocker. But Robert Knickerbocker was married, and he said that he would leave his wife for Diane. She offers to kill his wife, and he's like, no, let's just move. Part two is already posted. Brooklyn called her sister around 4 a.m. asking if anyone could come and pick her up, but her sister did not pass her driving test and couldn't drive, and her cousin had been drinking and also could not drive. Brooklyn then tried to get a hold of her ex-fiance, who she was still close to at the time, to ask if he could come pick her up. He said that he would come and pick her up after he was done with work sometime between 6 and 6.30 a.m. However, shortly after 4 a.m., Brooklyn began sending him a series of text messages saying things like, please hurry and I'm scared. The messages stopped for a while and then around 5.30 a.m., her ex-fiance received another text message from her saying, never mind, I'm okay, I'm going to a party in Rockcastle County. And Rockcastle County is a neighboring county to where she was at at the time. That was the last text message ever sent from Brooklyn Farthing's phone. The next morning, Brooklyn was supposed to attend a car show with friends, but when she didn't show up, her family and friends started questioning where she was. They find out that she was last seen the night before with a man named Josh. Part three coming up. But this was literally on my car like this. This is why you have to be careful. I don't really know what to do moving forward with this, but this definitely looks like a tracker to me. All right. So this is so crazy, you guys. 22-year-old Abigail Saldana was a proud mom who worked as a brow artist and an exotic dancer at Rick's Cabaret in Texas. Now, whilst working as a dancer, Abigail reported being harassed by a customer named Stanley Zulliger. Now, Stanley was relatively unknown in the club, but he would come by to see Abigail. Now, what no one knew is he had developed an impression that he was sort of dating her. He thought he had become more than just a customer to Abigail. Now, on the 14th of October, Abigail posted that Instagram video that you saw at the beginning. She had found a tracking device attached to her car. Now, she did report the incident to police, and she also told authorities that she believed she was being followed. She had no idea just how right she was. Uploading part two shortly. And for more Seven Sin Crimes, remember to hit that plus button. What do you think is gonna happen? So you find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree? Yes. Is that unanimous? Yes. Eric Smith was only 14 years old when he was given a sentence of nine years to life in prison. Smith had been convicted of murdering four-year-old Derek Roby. But before his arrest, many residents in Savona, New York, thought it might have been the work of an evil adult. Late in the afternoon, the body of Derek Roby was found. It was just a, a brutal, brutal killing. When police found Derek, they discovered that he had been lured into a wooded area not far from his home, strangled and beaten with rocks. When this terrible thing was done, I think everybody, th including myself, thought it was an adult. And how could anybody do such a terrible, terrible thing? But Smith had walked into the police command center four days after the murder, offering to help police solve the crime. Smith said that he had seen Derek that day with a white t-shirt on holding a lunch bag. Investigators felt like Smith knew something, but didn't realize the killer was sitting right in front of them. Then two days after Derek Roby's funeral, Smith confessed. Grandpa! Grandpa! Yeah, yeah. I was there. I was there when my grandson confessed. And it was... It was terrible. Investigators and community members tried to understand why a 13-year-old boy would do such a thing. They learned that Smith had a history of being picked on as a young child. 
His bright red hair and freckles made him a target for bullies. I don't know why he did it. I asked him why he did it. His words almost verbatim were, I don't know, I just saw this kid, this blonde kid, and I wanted to hurt him. After he was convicted and sentenced, Smith was sent to Brookwood Juvenile Detention Center. Love you, Eric. Love you, Eric. Love you, honey. Love you. When Eric Smith was sentenced, was there a sense, now we can get on with our lives? You hear the nine years to life. And I think back then, everybody was focusing on the life side of it. The true crime story of how they were caught. In Lubbock, Texas, a man noticed a suitcase while working at the landfill. He decided to open it up and saw a body in the fetal position. She appeared to be badly bruised and beaten, and she had a tattoo of the name Summer on her ankle. Police would determine the cause of death was asphyxiation, and they found through fingerprint records her name was Summer Lee Baldwin. The suitcase did not contain fingerprints, but police were able to find a tag and contact the manufacturing company who said that this suitcase was only sold in Walmart stores. The UPC on the bag tracked to a specific Walmart store which showed a man at about 3 a.m. on the day of the crime purchasing the bag along with some latex gloves. Credit card was used in the purchase which came back to a man named Rosindo Rodriguez. They tracked his card to a gas station which happened to be near a Holiday Inn that he stayed. Police would go into his hotel room and find blood on the carpet, the box spring, and the sheets. Police also found a trash can in the hallway that contained a Walmart bag and latex gloves in that bag. Police found him taking a selfie of him getting onto a bus back to San Antonio and cell phone records showing him going back to his family's home there. The latex gloves police found had Summer's DNA on the outside and on the inside had his DNA along with her DNA. He would deny involvement and police would search his computer and find something even more sinister. Police found the suspect was in online communication with Summer and had also been searching news articles about the woman. Furthermore, police uncovered communication online between him and a 16 year old girl named Joanna Rogers. Police were now suspecting that the suspect was involved in another crime with another woman. Joanna had disappeared 18 months earlier and had left her phone, keys, clothes behind and had just disappeared. Phone records would show Rosindo making a phone to the family's landline the night of that crime. Police learned that the family's trash went to the same landfill as the first victim, so they started organizing a search to search it. After several months of searching, a backhoe would uncover another suitcase which would contain Joanna's body. Dental records would confirm the identity of Joanna. or DNA from Summer's rape kit would come back to Rosindo. Rosindo was sentenced to death in Texas and executed, and that was how he was caught. So, when we, I may take an early lunch, and if that's in your cell, then you can go get it and bring it, but without that letter, I'm not allowing this line of questioning. Do you have the letter with so, you in court? I just said no. How okay. many times I got to say the same thing on, on, on record? You know, sometimes, sir, I don't hear what you say because you interrupt me so much or you answer quietly. And, and I'm taking notes and I'm focused on probably a dozen things at the same time. But if I, but if I say something under my breath, everybody seems to hear it. Everybody seems to hear in that just fine. In a quiet courtroom, yes, we assumes, can hear it very and clearly. Everybody assumes that it has to be disparaging once again, you're doing this tactic because to try to it, it's not a tactic. It's facts. We're talking it's facts. About to some other reason, it's facts. Because I, I find thing. it hard to believe that. Um, I'm gonna all let of the a state, sudden, nobody hears what I say. I'm gonna let the state oh, man, make stop. a record of why they stop. believe it's objectionable because I haven't let them do that. I've given you multiple opportunities to tell me why you so believe I, it's. I didn't get these pictures from they, nobody else. Why was somebody else? The record will else, reflect you have two pictures that you believe were from this witness. That I know is from. No, that you believe. That I know. All right. I'll ask the state their position on all of this. My position, Your Honor, is that these pictures, first of all, should not be admissible. One, because of a discovery violation. We've never seen them before. Two, because we have reason to believe that he did not get them from Erica Patterson. He is on a jail phone call talking to his mother, Dawn Woods. Uh, about Don Woods sending these photographs to him. Now, that's a lie. I object Let to that. the state make their argument without interruption, sir. That's a lie, though. Three, I believe that these photographs are designed to make a suggestion to the jury that Erica Patterson is a bad mom. I think that that's what the defendant is trying to do. And if we're going to go down that road, 
then we would be forced to counter that claim. First of all, it doesn't make her an incredible witness, if it's even true. And second of all, if we go down that road, we would be forced to counter that claim by pointing out that not only does the defendant not live with the child in question, he doesn't live with any of the other children that he has, he impregnated Erica Patterson when she was a minor in Nevada, and for doing so, he was convicted of statutory sexual seduction, pled guilty in March of 2007 to that felony offense, and is a sex offender on the registry as a result. So if there's any causation that would lead to Erica Patterson being a bad mom, Mr. Brooks has a direct role in that causation. And that's Further not more, to that, I'm not because sure. that's a lie. Let him at finish. The end of the day, Let him we, finish. We're going to open the Mr. door on that. No, since he want to make a record and not be accurate, so let's be ac accurate all on the record since you think you know so much. Once so again, we can Mr. Open Brooks the door is on, being we can loud, open the door on how old she told me she was when we met. We can ask that question he is to him. Over the top, Did you ask animated that? Do you right know now. that? Mr. Brooks, I'm ordering you to sit down and to let the state no, finish. No, I'm not going to sit here and let somebody be inaccurate on the record and lie on the record. Right. Under Illinois versus Allen, I've warned him repeatedly. He's being removed from the courtroom. Um, and you know what? Let me dial that back. We're just going to take an early lunch. One hour. We'll be back. And uh, unless he brings that letter Dog and he can show it is inadmissible, you know she will on. not be questioned. And under 906.11, I yeah, will declare the cross-examination closed. Know where, what Thank you. We're in recess. One hour. Happened, right? Get your facts straight. So let's, let's open the door on all of it then so we can get all of it on the record. The day after Sheila and Rachel ended Skylar's life, Rachel, the next morning, went to church camp. But what Sheila did is quite quite literally disgusting. The next day, Skylar's parents were freaking out. They had no idea where she was. And so her mom began to call Skylar's friends and family. And when Skylar's mom called Sheila, Sheila went over to Skylar's house, met with her mom and dad, sat on Skylar's bed, cried with her mother, wondering when Skylar was going to come home. So she ended her life the night prior, then was sitting on Skylar's bed, consoling her mom, telling her that everything was gonna be okay and that Skylar would come home and that they would find her. And not only did she do that, but she literally tweeted, and I quote, we really did go on three. And that to me just shows how messed up of a person she is. And when Rachel came back from church camp, they continued to put up this whole facade of, oh my gosh, where's our best friend? What happened to her? Where is she? For about five months. These girls were full on in the fall when school started, went back to school. They were walking around high school like absolutely nothing. And granted, they were suspects and they were being interrogated throughout the school year. And there were rumors going around Morgantown that they did it, but nothing was ever solidified. But in December of 2012, Rachel had an insane mental breakdown. Then a week later, she called her lawyers and she said, I need to tell you something. And that's when she told the cops that they did it. Mia Marcano. Mia Marcano. Mia Marcano. The extensive search to find Mia. What happened to Mia? Mia Marcano was a 19-year-old college student. Originally from Miami, she graduated from Charles Flanagan High School. Mia graduated in 2020, and shortly after, she moved to Orlando, Florida, where she attended Valencia College. People who knew Mia described her as funny, smiling, and always laughing. While attending Valencia College, Mia worked at the Arden Villa's apartments. On September 24th, 2021, Mia was supposed to get on a flight down to Miami, to meet her family for Carnival. But when Mia didn't board her flight and her family couldn't get a hold of her, her family got worried. At 9.32 p.m., Mia's mom contacted the Orange County Sheriff's Office to report that they couldn't reach Mia. At 9.42, an Orange County Sheriff's deputy was dispatched to Arden Villas to check on Mia's well-being. Mia was not found at her apartment. And at 1.36 a.m. on September 25th, Mia Marcano was entered into the system as a missing person. Mia's family decided to drive up to Orlando to see what was going on for themselves. They arrived at the Arden Villas around 3 a.m. on September 25th. And when they arrive, they're met with an Orange County Sheriff's deputy and Armando Caballero. Now for some background on Armando Caballero. He was a 27-year-old maintenance worker at Arden Villas, where Mia worked. It was known that Caballero had been pursuing Mia, even though she had made it very clear that she was not interested in him romantically. There's evidence of, of obsession. You're fascinated with There's Mia. Mia's family is convinced that Caballero has something to do with her.
He's my child. I am your mother, Kamaya. I am your mother. On July 10th, 1998, Shania Mobley's water broke. She headed to University Medical Center in Jacksonville, Florida with her uncle, whom she was living with at the time. Her boyfriend, 25-year-old Craig Aiken, wouldn't be there. He was incarcerated at the time for drug charges. That afternoon, Shanara gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. She named her Kamaya Mobley. Shanara was assigned to room 328. She arrives after giving birth and realizes her uncle is gone. It's just her and her newborn baby girl, Kamaya. Then, a woman who had been lingering in the maternity ward for hours and asking about Shanara and her baby walks into her room. The woman is comforting, kind, and helpful to the new young mother and her hours old infant. The woman dressed in scrubs stays with Shanara for over five hours. Shanara is exhausted from childbirth. The woman in scrubs tells her that she's taking Kamaya for shots and that she'll be back in 15 minutes. As she leaves room 328, she runs into paternal grandmother Velma Akins. Excitedly, she asks to see her new grandchild. The woman quickly shows her baby Kamaya and insists she'll be right back once shots are complete. Velma notices that the woman is wearing a shoulder bag, but she's so full of joy that she just makes a mental note. What happens next will spiral and stun investigators and family for the next 18 years. Shania and Velma notice a significant amount of time go by, and they haven't seen the woman in scrub. So they ask another hospital member to bring them baby Kamaya. Panic ensues when they realize baby Kamaya is not in the nursery. The police arrive and Shannara recalls the moment. Tell us what you did with the baby. Tell us where the baby is. Young Shannara could not understand why she was being treated like a suspect. University Medical Center falls under harsh scrutiny for failing to follow protocols which led to the disappearance of baby Kamaya. Although none of the hospital staff knew or recognized the woman in scrubs, she was never questioned. They believe she knew the family because she referred to Shania and the baby by name. It was hospital policy to photograph all newborns for record keeping. University Medical had not done this. So this composite sketch was drawn up. A national search begins for baby Kamaya and leads come in from coast to coast. The hospital offers a reward of $250,000. Shannara Mobley pleads for the kidnapper to bring back her baby. Please, please bring my baby. This is the bassinet where Kamaya Mobley was supposed to sleep. It would remain empty for years. Shannara would have a cake to celebrate Kamaya's birthday every year with the hopes that one day she'd be reunited with her. Are you interested in the Black Dahlia case? If so, you need to hear this. This is the mysterious disappearance of Jean Spangler. 26-year-old Jean Spangler was an aspiring actress in the golden age of Hollywood. She had dreams of making it big. She had a five-year-old daughter with her ex-husband, and after an abusive relationship, the two divorced and were in the middle of a bitter custody battle. On the evening of October 7, 1949, Spangler left her Park La Brea Los Angeles apartment. She was going to leave her daughter with her sister-in-law Sophie while Spangler's mom, Florence, who also lived with them, was away on a trip. She told Sophie that she was going to meet her ex-husband to pick up a late child support payment and then she would be heading on to work for the evening as an extra on a film set. The next day, when Jean didn't return home, Sophie reported her missing. On Sunday morning, a worker at Griffith Park in Los Angeles discovered a handbag police identified as Spangler's in the Ferndale area of the park. The handle was damaged and in her purse they found a note written by Spangler. It read, Kirk, can't wait any longer. Going to see Dr. Scott, it will work best this way while mother is away. Jean's ex-husband was questioned and he had an alibi that evening. And the only Kirk they could find any connection to was actor Kirk Douglas. Jean had recently worked on the film Young Man with a Horn starring Douglas, but he told police he was in Palm Springs at the time of her disappearance. And bizarrely enough, the Screen Extras Guild told investigators that Spangler wasn't even booked to work that evening. The TV studios had no record of her employment that night. A saleswoman at the farmer's market a few blocks from Spangler's home recalled seeing her that evening and noted that she appeared to be waiting for somebody. Only adding to the mystery, one of Jean's friends told police that Spangler admitted she was having an affair with somebody and she was really excited about it. Oh, and one more thing, she was reportedly pregnant. Police never located the Dr. Scott from the note, but there was a doctor in Los Angeles that was known to perform procedures for women who became pregnant. These procedures were illegal at the time, and he performed them under the radar. Who was this doctor, you might ask? George Hodel, the prime suspect in the Black Dahlia case. What? This is a big case. Go to part two for the conclusion. Tiptoe by the window.